So now it is 7.01, let's begin. My name is Dr. Edmund Stark. Um, uh, I have a PhD in chemistry, and I am one of the faculty members here at uh, St. Andrew's STEM Center in Midland. I'm a, um, one of MSU's uh, assistant professors, and we are going to be doing Mars, humanity's favorite planet. Now, tonight's agenda is the same as these talks usually are. I'll talk very briefly about some homework I gave from the last slideshow. Don't be panicked about homework, it's fine. Um, I'll talk about what's out in the sky tonight in the upcoming month, planets, um, asterisms, meaning patterns that aren't official constellations, uh, things like that. I'll spend most of the time talking about Mars and um, how we've ob observed it throughout the centuries. And I'll give a summary on that and a little bit of homework, and then I'll do questions. And as uh, Mr. Henton has already pointed out, uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk. There will be a number of obvious places, for example, at breaks in these sections, where I will be able to stop and take questions. Last month, uh, so this is what homework looks like. I asked people to look at Jupiter and Saturn as they're moving around in the evening, and to find the teapot, because it's easy to find when you've got Jupiter and Saturn right there. Uh, Mars was visible in the evening, Venus in the morning. There was one special thing where the moon was close to Venus on September 14th. And if you could catch the um, moon or catch Venus during the day, yes, during the day, because you have something nearby to use to point. And I was able to do that. It was kind of clear that day. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, basically giving you where the planets are more or less right now. Um, this drawing is not to scale, uh, neither the orbits nor the planets are to scale, but it gives you a sense of where things are. So here's the sun and here's the earth and here are the planets orbiting on the inside. Everything goes counterclockwise. Here are the planets going on the outside. So there's earth, the big green dot. Venus in white is over here. It is moving this way, so it's moving away from us, and it's still the brightest thing in the sky. Mercury, I don't have an orbit for Mercury, so I'll draw one in. Mercury is here. It is moving towards us, so it's actually going to get a little bit brighter in the next few days. Mars is very close to us, very near what we call opposition, meaning it's on the opposite side of the sun from the earth. And that means it's a good time for viewing. Jupiter is much more distant than this, but I'm going to put it out here because that's at about the right angle. And Saturn is way out here as well. And you'll notice they're kind of almost lined up, Jupiter a little to the right of it from our point of view. And we'll see that in the sky. And here's what it looks like. Jupiter and Saturn in the evening sky. Jupiter is the bright um, planets. People have been watching planets for thousands of years. Why? Because they are obvious. Jupiter is the brightest thing in the sky. It's the brightest, quote, star at sunset and on into the night. Saturn is the brightest thing anywhere near Jupiter. It's just uh, maybe uh, less than a fist away. And here is a part of the constellation Sagittarius called the teapot. I think you can see why. And you can use those to help find the teapot if you're not familiar with the constellation Sagittarius. Later on in the month, Saturn will always be to the left of Jupiter, but depending on how they're rising and setting, the stars and the planets rise and set just like the sun does, and they get low in the sky and they change orientation a little bit. But October 22nd, and these other days as well, but October 22nd in the evening, the moon is going to be particularly close to these two. And that gives you an example of when you can use them as an index and watch the moon move over the course of an hour or even less. Mars. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Mars in the last few months because it's coming up onto a good, really good time to observe. And there, you can find a lot of stuff on the internet. You need to know where to look. Mars will be in the constellation Pisces. Star charts and astronomy-related magazines, good grief. These folks are trying to get you to download their planetarium app. This is absolute rubbish. 
using Pisces to find Mars, Mars is 200 times brighter than any star in Pisces. Here's a finder chart for Mars. It, you look to the east a couple hours after sunset. If you see one thing, it's Mars. It's that easy. It's the brightest thing out there. When it comes closest to Earth, like it's doing now, it outshines even mighty Jupiter, the king of the planets. And now, through the end of October, is the best time to see Mars for the next 15 years. And just for fun, you can do the same thing here on October 2nd. Mars will be almost on top of the moon, or I should say the moon will almost be on top of Mars. And you will be able to watch the moon move over the course of an hour just by keeping it it with a reference based on Mars. That, I think that's a fun thing to do. So don't miss this. This is not a particularly good time to see Mercury. Um, it is furthest from the sun on October 1st. So within a week of October 1st is a good time to look. Um, it gets a little brighter afterwards. So after October 1st is even better. But this time around, it's always fairly near the horizon. and It's kind of lost in the glare of the sun. Um, but it's still visible if you have, but the key is you can't have a lot of trees in the horizon. And let's not forget beautiful Venus. It is brilliant, dominates, absolutely dominates the morning sky. Um, here is a first magnitude star. I'll talk about what that means today. And Venus, uh, this is one of the brightest stars in the sky and Venus outshines it by a factor of 200. Venus will continue to light up the morning sky until next year. So here is a star chart. And if you wish, I can uh, email you if you, if you um, want, you can email me after the uh, program. And um, you can just uh, ask if you want some information. I can send you these little things that I suggest you do. You see Jupiter and Saturn right here. All right, and there's the teapot as I've described. If you use Jupiter and Saturn, you go from the horizon on up, the next brightest star here is, come on, is Altair. And it is in the constellation of Aquila, right here, Aquila the Eagle. Easier, and it, is, it lies between Altair and Jupiter and Saturn. Up here are the three brightest stars in the top of the sky, Altair, Vega, which is probably the brightest one, and Deneb. Three first magnitude stars, they form something called the Summer Triangle, and the constellation of Cygnus is in the Summer Triangle. I think you can use Jupiter and Saturn to help you find each of these patterns. And so that's a fun thing to do if you're just learning about the sky. But there's more. The Orionid meteor shower. It's called the Orionid shower because it appears to come from the constellation of Orion, in particular here where he has his arm raised up or his club, if you're into the, um, the patterns that people sometimes draw. The peak is October 22nd, but any time within a week of that will be good. It's best after, well, it's really only after midnight because Orion isn't really in the sky very high until after midnight. And that's pretty much what all meteor showers are like. Now, you're not going to see a burst like this. A good meteor shower like this one gives you, this one gives you 20 per hour. So in other words, you'll get about one meteor every three minutes. That constitutes a meteor shower. And if you've never seen one, it's kind of fun to watch. So I would recommend that. And just announced last week, we are in a new solar cycle. These are sunspot counts. And they get peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. I talked a lot about this a few months ago when I talked about the sun. Well, we were in a low, and we've been in a low sunspot count for quite a while. And they just announced last week that they decided the new sunspot cycle started last December. These things take a while to come up with. So for those of you who like sunspots and have a telescope, this is important. And speaking of the sun, Today at 9.30 in the morning was the autumnal equinox, the official start of fall. So um, what do you do for autumnal equinox? If nothing else, pay attention outside and notice that this time of the year, the days change very quickly. They get shorter, the nights get longer, but it happens really fast near the equinox. 
and the sun rising and setting on the horizon. If you have a clear horizon and you can see sunset, watch how the sun slowly moves from day to day at the sunrise or sunset point, if you have that option. So here is tonight's agenda. I've just finished um, these first two parts. Um, have any questions come in on these? Yes, uh, we have a couple. Okay. Um, is Venus or Jupiter brighter in the sky? They think they heard both so far in the last couple slides. Yeah, Venus, Jupiter is brighter than any other um, thing in the sky at the same time, but Venus is the brightest planet. It is always brighter than Jupiter when it's in the sky. And it's in the sky right now. Um, so Venus will be brighter than Jupiter, but Jupiter is in the um, evening sky and Jupiter will have set by the time Venus rises, long before Venus rises. So right now when Jupiter's in the sky, it's the brightest thing. When the sun sets, the first star you will see is Jupiter. And in the morning, the first, the first star you'll see is Venus. The other question? Well, uh, the second question, it's really more of a comment, but they say that a new sunspot cycles is great news for ham radio operators. Ah, yes, because you get more, um, more field storms and you get those special moments when you can talk to people on the other side of the world, bouncing things off the ionosphere. Um, I think that's a, really, that's a really cool point. And that's all for now. That's all for now. Then I will move on to tonight's focus and I have a little um, subgroup here. I'm gonna talk about early observations, the motion, the brightness and things like that. I'll be talking a lot about the telescope age because we've been looking at Mars through a telescope for about 400 years now. I don't think people realize how important Mars was to early telescope studies. And I wanna spend a long time about life on Mars because you know people talk about little green men and people talk about Martians but nobody talks about Jupiterians. Nobody talks about Mercurians. You know, when you talk about aliens from space, Martians comes to mind. Why is that? I'm gonna to wanna to talk about that. And I'm also talking about um, some of the challenges that you have trying to observe something like Mars with a telescope. I'll spend a lot of time on the space age and show you a lot of fun pictures, but you know what? There is so much stuff about Mars that I, am, I decided kind of arbitrarily um, that I am going to do a second talk on Mars sometime in the future with a lot more of the newest results because there's so much stuff on Mars, you just can't do it in one hour. So to begin, early, tell, early observations. What did the ancient astronomers know about Mars? Mars is a planet, which means it's a bright wandering star. Planet, planetos in Greek is the word for wanderer. Mars moves back and forth through the zodiac constellations, just like the other planets. Um, takes over two years to make a full circle around the sky and coming back to the same constellation, which is slower than Mercury and Venus, but much faster than Jupiter or Saturn. It, has, it moves forward in the sky, it moves backwards in the sky, and these are vaguely predictable. Um, this is Claudius Ptolemy here, the great astronomer from the first or second century um, AD. And he had a model Earth-centered, everything goes around the Earth, that worked more or less for a thousand years. It's good, not good enough. How is Mars different from the other planets? The most obvious thing is Mars is noticeably red. When you look at Mars in the sky, especially actually when it's on the faint side, you will notice that it's quite red. The other planets are basically white. Saturn's a little off-white. Mars varies greatly in brightness when compared to the others, and we'll talk about why that is. And its motion also seems to vary more than the others. It seems to be more quirky. It moves really quick at some times, and then other times it just sort of sits, and it, I can imagine that really drove the ancient astronomers nuts. And here's an example of Mars's dramatic motion. This black line you see here is the motion of Mars throughout this calendar year, 2020. So we're starting out in January in Libra. And in January here, we're moving through um, uh, Scorpius. February, and we are moving here through Scorpius and Sagittarius. 
March in Sagittarius, April is in Capricorn, May is in Aquarius, June up to mid-June, we're getting out of Aquarius, and now we are entering Pisces. But look what happens here for the rest of the year. We slow down in August and September come to a stop start looping up backwards through October and November. And in late November, we start turning around and into December and early January. So we basically go through a constellation a month for half the year. And then we spend seven straight months never getting out of Pisces. This is the kind of thing that Mars does. Comparing this to Jupiter, this red arc here is basically the entire motion of Jupiter for the year 2020. So you can see how much quickly Mars moves. Now, I mentioned earlier, uh, we talked about color, I wanted to talk about brightness. In order to talk about brightness, we have to start using some numbers. Um, what is brighter than others and how do you rank stars? Hipparchus um, ranked the brightness of, of stars 2000 years ago, and we still use that same system. He took the 20 brightest stars that he could see, um, he was in the Northern Hemisphere, and he called them first magnitude. Think of that as like first class stars. The next brightest he called second class stars or second magnitude. There are about 70 of them. And so on, third magnitude is fainter, fourth, all the way down to sixth magnitude, which are the faintest that we can see with the unaided eye. So the, the bigger the number, the fainter the star. And that makes sense if you think of it as like a first class star is obviously better than a sixth class star. So modern astronomers have extended that because with telescopes, we can see stars that are fainter, even with binoculars, that are fainter than what the human eye can see. So we have magnitude seven, eight, nine, ten, very, very faint stars. But we also have things like the planets, which are brighter than stars. And so we have magnitudes not only of one, but of zero and negative one and so on. And we've also digitized it. So you can have a star that's magnitude 5.4 or negative 1.37. All right. So, and the difference, the first mag, according to Hipparchus, and we've kept that, a first magnitude star is a hundred times brighter than a sixth magnitude star. And that's the system we still use. So how do the planets fit in? Here's a graph. I've got the, I've got four of the bright planets and I have magnitude six down here, the faintest we can see up to first magnitude. This green band represents where the first magnitude stars reside. There is one bright star in the Northern sky called Sirius, which sits here, but all the rest are here. Look at Venus at negative three, totally dominating everything. Jupiter way up here at negative two and negative three and Saturn also in this range. Also brighter than, when these two are in the sky, they're brighter than any star. Saturn is brighter than almost all stars. Only maybe a dozen stars are as bright as Saturn. But look at red Mars, varying by a factor of 50 or more in a given cycle, given two year cycle, much more than the other planets. So as an astronomer, you have to ask why. And we're gonna explain that. Um, some basics. Copernicus proposed about 500 years ago that the sun was the center of the solar system and not the earth. Only the moon goes around the earth. Everything else goes around the sun. And he also got the order of the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and the relative distances. Okay. I will want to add that this exact system, including the planets in their proper order, had already been postulated by Aristarchus of Samos 2,000 years ago, 2,200 years ago. So, lest he be forgotten. But he was not believed at the time. Modern astronomy in some ways begins in 6209 because of these two people. If you've attended my talks in the past, you probably recognized a fellow on the left as Galileo Galilei, inventing the telescope and a whole bunch of other things. The guy on the right, Johannes Kepler, with his three great laws of planetary motion governing the planets. Now, I'm only going to 
invoke the first one, that planets don't travel in circles, they travel in ellipses with the sun off center. That's important to understand Mars's brightness. So to get a sense of the solar system here, telescopes are allowing more precise observations of planetary positions. Kepler's laws allow us to actually calculate where they should be, but all of this is relative, meaning we had figured out, let's say by 1650, Jupiter is five times further from the sun than the Earth. But how far away is it in terms of miles? How far away is the Earth from the sun? We had no real idea. All we knew were the relative distances. How are we going to measure those distances? That's what scientists do. They take measurements and learn things. We're going to measure the distances to the planets by parallax. Now, you may have seen this demonstration before. If you have, um, you can do it again, it's fun. But if you haven't, take your thumb and line it up with something like I'm lining it up with the camera. Line it up with something on the other side of the room, close your left eye and line it up with your right eye. Now, if you close your right eye and open your left, your thumb seems to move against the background. Maybe it's a picture you have on the wall, maybe it's a window, but your thumb seems to move. Now, the thumb hasn't moved, it's only your perspective. And if you bring your thumb closer, it moves even more when you do that. Well, if you can measure, the, if you know the distance between your eyes and you know the distance and you know the angle that it moves, you can calculate how far away it is. That's what parallax is. If we can measure one planet, we can get all of them because we know the relative distances. Which planet should be measured? Mars. And I'm going to talk about Giovanni Domenico Cassini. In 1673, he determined the absolute distance to Mars by the parallax method. But you can't do this just with your own telescope and your friend's telescope 100 yards apart. He had to measure it across continents. He measured the parallax of Mars from Paris. At the same time, this is a planned experiment, John Richter measured the position from Cayenne Island in modern day French Guyana on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So the results gave the distance to Mars relative to the distance from Paris to Cayenne, which they knew, and they could calculate the distance to Mars. And from there, they got all of the distances. Their value for Earth Sun is 87 million miles. The modern value is 93 million miles. Both are only short of 7% 7, 7 short of the today's values. That is amazing to do that 400 years ago. And I will want to add that John Flamsteed also did the same thing using Earth's rotation to do his parallax for him. And he got the same number. So you remember this diagram, the bright planet orbits, but I told you it wasn't to scale. Now I'm gonna give it to you in scale because here are the numbers. Here, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. So here's the average distances, all right? And the average time, remember superior conjunction right here is when it's on the other side of the sun from us or here in opposition when it's right on top of us. So I'm going to look at these numbers down here. When Mars is in opposition, on average, it's less than 50 million miles away. When it's far, it's almost five times that. Compare that to Saturn, okay? which only varies by about 20 to 25%. So that tells you why Mars brightness varies so much because its distance from us varies so much. Here are the inner planets in orbit to scale, all right? This is kind of centered on the sun and Earth orbit is put in flat. Here you can see Mars orbit on the outside. And what you, how does Mars stand out? First of all, it's off center. You can see that this distance is not the same as that distance. And that's because it's in one of those eccentric ellipses that Kepler discovered. Second, I'm gonna use some fancy words here. The perihelion of Mars right here, where it's closest to the sun, is close to Earth's aphelion, which is here where Earth is furthest from the sun. So when Mars and Earth are in this area, they are closer together 
even then the then their ellipsis would point out so that really helps um give you a sense of why it's so different when it's over here versus all the way on the other side now where is jupiter jupiter would be just off the page here a little bit off to the side and saturn would be twice as far away to give you a sense of the size so what does this eccentricity mean for Mars? Eccentricity meaning there's an elliptical orbit. That means that the distance at opposition varies a lot. If there's a really good opposition here where Mars is at its perihelion when it's closest to the sun, this distance here is only 35 million miles. If Earth is over here and Mars is in opposition, they're still really close, but compared to being on the other side of the sun, but the distance is 63 million miles, almost double. Now in 2003, some of you, many of you were alive then, we had the closest perihelion to Mars, closest opposition to Mars in about 60,000 years as per calculations. And it will be even slightly better 250 years from now. Right now, we are here in 2020 and we have a pretty good opposition, but you'll notice Oh, I shouldn't say in those, I don't really have it on here, but here, the next one will, 2022 will be here and 2024, 25 will be here. And so it will continue to get worse and we won't get any better than this year until the year 2035, when we will be in about that position. So that's the orbit. What about Mars's rotation? Um, I would, I would mention that uh, way back in 1650s, you notice these observations are two years apart because they're observing here during the best opposition and one opposition on either side. Giovanni Riccioli and Francesco Grimaldi, a pair of Jesuit astronomers, um, this was actually his assistant, they observed light and dark patches on Mars. And this, as far as I know, is the, fine, the first time surface detail was seen on any planet, even, be, even before, meaning moving detail, as opposed to the bands on Jupiter, which don't seem to change until Hook discovered the great red spot about 10 years later. This fellow here is Christian Huygens, or Christian Huygens, as we typically call him. He composed the first map of Mars in 1659, and it clearly shows a feature which we now recognize, which we now call as Sirtis Major, and you may have seen one of the ice caps. Um, and this is, this is Hergens. Giovanni Domenico Cassini, who we already spoke of, he described the South Polar ice cap, and he used the surface features on Mars to watch Mars rotating, and he determined the length of the Martian day. One rotation period, he calculated 24 hours and 40 minutes, only three minutes off from what we have today. That is amazing work. And I didn't include a picture of Giovanni and, or sorry, of um, Riccioli and Grimaldi. I'm just gonna put this up here. Do you see these, the big crater and the small crater here? Those are the craters Riccioli and Grimaldi, and they're friends of mine. I enjoy these two craters. Um, because of something called, um, well, because of something that the moon does, where sometimes you can see them and sometimes you can't. And I haven't talked about the moon, but I should probably do that because it's pretty easy to see. That would be a fun talk. But sometime in the future. For those of you who like numbers, here's the Earth, Moon, and Mars compared. Um, I simply pulled out a few of them. The diameter of Mars is about half that of Earth. Its mass is about one-tenth of Earth. But some striking similarities. One day on, one, on Earth is 24 hours, Mars it's 24.7 hours. The axis tilt of Earth, which gives us the seasons, is 23 degrees. On Mars it's about 25 degrees. Very similar numbers. And because of that, Mars has similar days and similar seasons that we have. Very different things no magnetic field, that's one of the things I'm gonna to wait to talk about on another Mars uh, talk, because that turns out to be potentially extremely important for Mars's natural history. It also has a very thin atmosphere, about six millibars, whereas the Earth's atmosphere is one bar. So this is, whatever unit, this is um, less than a percent of 
Earth's atmosphere. And just as a comparison, if this is the size of the Earth, you see it's in gibbous phase, so this is taken from the Moon. Um, this is about the size of Mars, a little bit more than half. And the Moon would be a little bit more than half Mars. I didn't think of that until just now. Rats, I should have put the Moon in there. Maybe next time. Now, Mars is the red planet. These pictures look kind of brownish. Is Mars really red once you get there? Yes, it is. It is predominantly red, just like it looks from our sky. And that's, there's no illusion there. Um, why? Rust. Surface rocks and dust on Mars are rich in iron oxide. Iron oxide is literally rust, and it colors Mars a nice rust color. Now, obviously, since you know what iron, you know what rust is, Earth has iron oxide. Is there any place on Earth that has color like this? And yes, there is. If you've ever seen Ayers Rock, or now called Uluru, by its older name in central Australia, it looks like this. And boy, can you tell that that has iron oxide on it. And if that were lurking on Mars, it would be right at home. Now I'm gonna skip, um, in the, most of the um, 1700s, people worked at, many discoveries were made in the 1600s because we just had telescopes for the first time. Anything works. In the 1700s, we spent a lot of time improving our telescope making and using. 1800s, telescopes started getting bigger and better and much more effective. The great opposition of 1877, this is one of those where it's not an ordinary opposition, we're really close. Um, Asaph Hall discovered Phobos and Deimos at the old Naval Observatory, well, at what, what was then the Naval Observatory. Um, and if this is the size of Mars, this dot here is Phobos. It's only 14 miles across. It's a little chunk. It is one, what, what does that come to? One five hundredth the size of, the moon, of our moon. Deimos is another chunk, a seven mile diameter. And it would be, let's say, three times this distance further out. So Mars has two moons, but they're really small. But that 1877 opposition, a lot of things started to happen with that. And that's going to be a fun thing to talk about. Um, Giovanni Schiaparelli observed the um, great opposition at the Brea Observatory in Milan, and he produced a detailed map of Mars. He found dark areas and light areas, just like um, the Jesuits had observed uh, 200 years earlier. He called them seas, the dark areas, and the light areas he called continents, just like the moon. You may, if you're familiar with the moon, you have um, the Sea of Serenity and the Sea of Tranquility. Remember Tranquility Base, actually. I, and over here is, this big area here is Oceanus Procolorum, or the Ocean of Storms. Um, so just like the moon, seas and continents. And here is uh, one of his maps that has come down to us. And now the first, he had this color, this is a black and white version. The first color map was produced by Secchi. Actually, this should be, whoops, this should be um, 1863. But Chaparelli's map became very well known. Some of the names on it are still used today. Uh, and for example, right here, I'm circling Certus Major, which I've already mentioned. But you see all these straight lines, especially some of them in pairs. Um, he didn't know what these were. He called them canali because he's Italian. But this was mistranslated into, instead of into channels or grooves, it was translated as canals. That is a problem. Why? Because canals are artificial. They are not natural. Canals have to be made. Now, what changed the world in 1869, right before he's doing this observation? The Suez Canal, the greatest canal that had ever been made up to that time. And therefore, if there are canals, Mars must have intelligent life. And that took root at about this time. Uh, you all, you've probably all heard that the um, most easily visible object from space is the Great Wall of China. That is totally false. It's hard to see. The Suez Canal, which is right here, is very easy to see from real space, not just from the from high orbit. 
So 19th century, better telescopes, more detail, but the seas don't always appear the same. They seem to change over time. Maybe they're not seas. Maybe they're vegetation that's growing or people are trying to explain this. But the assumption through all of this is that Mars has life. And this fellow, Camille Flammarion, was a astronomer and he put out a number of popular books. This one, the, that there are many inhabited worlds. Um, and in these three books, he talked about, among other things, potential life on Mars. This is even before Schiaparelli's drawings. And also Percival Lowell wrote three major books on Mars and its canals and what life must be like there. And these are scientists writing these books, not just science fiction writers. These are some of Percival Lowell's drawings. You see that there's a lot of canals and they seem to change with time. And that was taken as further evidence of life that maybe they're flooding some canals and not others. What did people think of this? Well, for generations, the public, as well as many astronomers, accepted life on Mars. H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds, was written at, in 1898 based on this kind of speculation where Martians try to take over the Earth. Edgar Rice Burroughs, A Princess of Mars, and the entire um, John Carter series, John Carter of Mars and Barsoom, which is the name for Mars in their native language. Um, wonderful books, which I've, I've read both. And other astronomers were also trying to do the same thing. And I'm going to talk about Eugène Antonadi. Here he writes, uh, and this is an interesting writing. He writes, the director's experience. So he's the director. He's talking in third person. The canals are very difficult objects visible only by rare glimpses. Had it not been for Professor Schiaparelli's wonderful discoveries and the foreknowledge that the canals are there, he, meaning Antionadi, would have missed three quarters of those that he sees. That's an interesting thing. Here is one of Antionadi's maps, and you can see there's a number of canals here, but he's a good observer. Look at Sirtis Major here compared to what we have in a modern photograph, this big angle here of light, which you also see here. You see these little things coming out with this big bay here. That's on here. This big area of light and then slightly less light also on the photo, also on the drawing up here, this area. I mean, there's a lot that's really good here, okay? But by the time Percival Lowell died in 1916, astronomers were convinced that the canals were illusions, partly through Antoniadi, who did his best to disprove them later in his career, and Vincenzo Cerulli as well. Um, but the thing you have to ask is, if they're illusions, how is this possible, okay? And let's spend some time on this. How can professional astronomers record illusions for decades. I'm going to talk about how this sort of thing can happen. I'm going to talk about how hard it is to observe through a telescope, talk about the limits of telescopes, the limits of atmospheric turbulence, difficulties unique to Mars, and difficulties in the way we perceive. Here is a graphic that shows the effect of the lens size, the big thing in the front that you're looking through. Um, the bigger the lens, the smaller a star will look. So you can see that the bigger the lens, the more precise your image can be and the more detail you can see, all other things being equal. So that you can go from this kind of fuzzy view of Mars to this kind of view of Mars, or sorry, of Saturn to this kind of view of Saturn. These are simulated images, okay? This is under perfect optics. Your telescope is perfect. The sky is perfect but the sky is never perfect. There are columns of air moving up and down and they make the image wiggle and boil. And the only way I can describe it is if you've ever seen a car coming towards you on a hot pavement, you see it kind of shimmers. Here's a nice photograph. Um, it's really bad and it, it affects telescopes big time because you're really zoomed in. And on a sunny day, when you're looking at night, the heat is rising off of everything and it is awful. Now here at low power, meaning no power with your own eyes, you can see that that's a truck. But imagine this effect at high power. Suppose you zoomed in with your telescope on that spot. Normally you could probably read the part number on the grill with a telescope. Under these conditions, you can't even notice that it's a grill. You don't even know what you're looking at. And the interesting thing is, 
here's the effect with a given telescope of how bad it can get with really bad atmospheric turbulence going from a dot look this is what a star would look like and this is what a star would look like with bad turbulence but it also turns out if you look at a star under certain seeing conditions and under bad seeing conditions and you make the telescope bigger it actually gets a little worse with a bigger telescope the exact kind you want so there's a lot of problems with observing through the earth's atmosphere so how do you do this you look for hours and wait until the image or part of it snaps clear you just happen to have a spot where there is no turbulence in your line of sight and then you draw what you saw at that moment so here oh the grill looks really good i'll draw this rest of the car is garbage who cares i can see this really well all right here i can see the side panel good detail on that here i can see the wheel i'll draw that and by the time you're done you've got a good picture of a car but you're drawing what you saw at that moment and then trying to put it together now remember just like this only one or two canals were visible at a given time now here are some so that's the problem with the atmosphere what about mars itself mars has a two-year cycle this is the best part of this year's cycle from last year in march to um uh next year in march so we're coming along here this is what it looks like at opposition here is only two months later it's just a little over half the size you really have a month on either side of opposition to get your best images and for the rest of the year mars is half the size of this so it becomes you really have only a couple of months every two years to observe so that's what i've summarized here but remember that you have these kinds of good oppositions and these kinds of less favorable oppositions. And this diagram shows how big Mars is on a good opposition versus a poor one. So if you're looking at this, you only have about two months every 15 years to look at it. And then there are dust storms. They didn't know what dust storms were at the time, but for example, the entire 2018, this really good opposition was pretty much obliterated because there was a near global dust storm at that time. So like you say, Mars changes from year to year as well, and that can be very difficult. And here is an example of some of those changes. We're looking at the Sirtis Major region. It's upside down here. And you can see that even over the course of a few years, this is clearly different. There are changes here. These are photographs, actual photographs. And this is completely unlike the moon. You take a picture of the moon, 20 years later, it's the same, but Mars changes. But how do we see illusions? Um, come in? Yeah, I was hoping we could take a moment to answer some questions. Um, let's do, give me one or two more slides. Okay. And then I'll get to them. So um, here's an interesting experiment. Um, a drawing of Mars with the accepted features, but no canals, was placed 10 feet away from regular observers, not astronomers, because they would know about the canals, and they were asked to sketch the image. They were able to reproduce the features, but as they continued to look and continued to work, they also would draw in canals on an image which did not have any. And what's interesting is they also put them in the same locations as Schiaparelli, where there are little dots in the images, your mind connects things with lines that may not be there and i'm going to show you a couple of illusions where this happens you may have seen these i'm interested in these but um this is a common illusion there are 12 black dots in this image here's one right here that i'm circling okay if you look at that dot you may see the dots on either side but you will not see the dots above even though they are all 12 there you cannot see all 12 of them at the same time because your peripheral vision is not as good and your mind, when you're looking at this, will tell you that this one over here is just gray. Your mind puts that in for you because it knows what's there. It looks at this and sees only that one black dot, everything else is gray, so your mind tells you all the other things are gray. Here's another one where that previous slide we talked about um, 
how our perception system can block us from seeing the black dots that were really there. This is called a scintillating grid. Pick any one, let's say this one, you'll see a nice white dot here, but if you look, if you notice in your peripheral vision, the others are black. But when you look at them, now it's white. The ones over here look black, but when I move over my eyes over here, now it looks white. And as you go back and forth, you can see them flashing back and forth. This time we're actually seeing dots that aren't there, or before we weren't seeing dots that are. And these are the kind of tricks that our minds can play on us. So here's a good spot to, to break for some questions. All right, uh, we have a few. How does the motion of Mars across the zodiac compare to Venus and Mercury? Well, Venus and Mercury um, move with the sun because they're inside the sun. So while they move back and forth fairly rapidly, since we go around the sun once a year, Venus and Mercury both go around, both go around us from our perspective once a year. Mars takes two years from our perspective. All right. And can you see Mars's moons with a telescope? No. Um, those were seen with a telescope, but they were using, um, well, you know, the article I read didn't say, but almost certainly in the old naval, um, they were using the Alvin Clark refractor, which I think is a 25 inch, like a 25 inch diameter, more than two feet diameter. I can't even make my hands big enough on this scale to show you how big a telescope that was. And that was during a very favorable opposition as well, the 1877 opposition. So yeah, you don't have to worry about seeing um, Phobos and Deimos with your telescope. It's, it's not gonna happen. Unless you have a lot more money than I think you do. <laughs> All right. And if there's iron on Mars, why is there no magnetism? Well, that's a good question. Um, the magnetism on Earth doesn't come because we have magnets. Um, it comes because iron itself is paramagnetic, meaning it, um, an iron atom itself has a magnetic moment. And there's iron flow, and we have a molten core. And it's that movement of the core that causes the magnetic field that we have. Mars is smaller and colder, and its magnetic field and its core, we believe, has frozen. So there is no movement. So it has no, it has no net magnetic field, or not none that's significant. Doesn't do any good. All right. And uh, does the sun look like bright shades of orange, red, yellow from Mars, or does the thinner atmosphere have? an impact on the color spectrum? Um, I think the sun will look a little bit reddened from Mars because of the tendency for there to be dust in Mars. That is the problem that uh, our spacecraft that have landed on Mars typically have is their solar panels get covered with dust. So I think very often you'll get a nice reddish looking color. Okay, and where did the oxygen on Mars come from to form iron oxide? What implications are there concerning iron oxide on Mars? Um, I would say it came from an early atmosphere which um, was lost, and I'd like to talk about that in a later program, um, but if you've got a lot of iron and a lot of oxygen, you end up with a lot of iron oxide. Um, this person asks, do any other planets have retrograde orbits? Um, no planets have retrograde orbits, but all planets appear to move backwards every now and then in their orbits from our perspective, because Earth is also moving around. And we have a parallax effect whereby we are moving back and forth. Well, we are moving and the planet is moving. And when we catch up to an outer planet, it seems to be moving backwards. And when an inner planet catches up with us, it seems to be moving backwards. But none of them actually move backwards. It's just from our perspective. All right. And uh, if the core is frozen on Mars, is there no volcanic activity? Or what causes it? Um, I don't know if there's any volcanic activity anymore. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a good question. I know that there are large volcanoes on Mars, um, but erosion on Mars is relatively slow. It has virtually no atmosphere and no rain and things like that. 
Um, so I don't know how old the vol volcanoes are. My assumption, and this is a guess, remember I'm a chemist, not an astronomer, is that those volcanoes are old and haven't erupted for a very long time. All right, and that seems to be all the questions for the moment. All right, well, good, more than I expected, but now that means, uh-oh, I'm behind, so I better get moving. So I'm gonna talk about the space portion, and I'll skip a few slides. I wanna talk here about the tremendous successes of the Soviet space program in the lunar landing, all the way from the first satellite, first landing, first lunar flyby, first lunar rover. These are all part of the Soviet space program successes. Look what happens when we start going to Mars. Nothing but failures. NASA had two failures as well, um, but they did have one successful flight um, called Mariner 4. It was simply a flyby. And I have here, this is what the Mariner looked like. And this is a picture taken the first photo from Mars. Cratered surface looks like the moon. Um, you sometimes see colored images from uh, Mariner. Those were actually colored by scientists with crayons. The photos themselves were black and white. Many were disappointed. It looks like the moon. There's no seas, no vegetation, and uh, certainly no channels. But uh, the Mariner era became much more successful. There were a few successful flybys and quite a number of failures. But I'll talk a little bit down here about this. Mariner 9 was a, the first successful orbiter, successful because it stayed in orbit long enough. Um, the Soviet Union had two orbiters earlier, but they essentially failed in their mission because in 1971, there happened to be a global dust storm and they didn't see anything. NASA's Mariner, with Mariner 9, which is here, took thousands of photographs, most of the surface, and it outlasted the dust storm. But here is a photo of the dust storm, and we mentioned volcanoes. This is Olympus Mons, and here's one of the Tharsis volcanoes. Um, the entire surface of the planet is covered in dust, and virtually the only thing you can see is this gigantic volcano tipping out of the dust. Um, so I, I included that because I think that's a pretty cool photo. A um, couple years later, remember this is in orbit, um, Mariner 9 takes a picture of this canyon near Galvales. Now, if this were on Earth, obviously this would be a canyon created by water. So therefore, scientists assume water might have caused this. Could there be life on Mars? And there's also a gigantic um, uh, crater, Valles Marineris. Um, here's a more modern photo. I don't have many modern photos. I'm kind of saving them for another time with a map of the US put on it. This is a canyon that covers 3,000 miles, almost an entire face of the planet. The Viking era, still a lot of failures, but some successes. The US had a lot of successes in the 70s, landers and orbiters. And what were they doing? This is Viking 2 lander, and here is the robotic arm where it could actually test some soil samples and try to look for life. They took thousands of photos, um, determined the composition of the atmosphere, no signs of life, although the results are a little controversial because frankly, we know more about microbes now than we did in the 1970s. And what we thought was a negative result, now we're not as sure. Um, but here is the first photo ever taken from Mars. Took its, the spacecraft took its own landing foot. Why would you do that? To determine the compaction of the soil to see how far you sank in. Useful for later missions, as you could imagine. This is the first color photo of Mars. It's the red planet, iron oxide. The atmosphere is thin, but yet you still see this reddish color in the distance due to a thin bit of dust in the atmosphere. Here's a neat photo. And I just have a bunch of photos here to show you because there's so many that's so cool. This is the, um, the lander. And here is its back shell. This is taken from the orbiter that is transmitting the lander's photographs to us. That's why we have a lander and an orbiter. The lander lands, takes photographs, talks to the orbiter. The orbiter sends things to us. Otherwise, if we just had the lander, we couldn't, when Mars rotates the wrong way, we'd get no information. So we have that planned. 
But the Mars race continues, fetter, or faster, better, and cheaper. NASA had some failures here, some successes. Um, and we have new players, Russia, after the Soviet Union collapsed, had a failure, Japan had a failure, NASA had multiple failures. But here I'm gonna talk about this one, the Sojourner rover. There it is. The Pathfinder lander landed with a big bunch of balls around it to cushion it. And this is the rover, two feet long, foot and a half wide, a foot high. Studied rocks and far, the rocks that it looked at were, many of them looked like they were conglomerate, meaning a bunch of rocks stuck together. On earth, that happens in a floodplain. So maybe this was in a floodplain, more evidence for ancient water. The race continues. Look at all the missions to Mars. This is why I said the favorite planet. We have a new category here because here for the first time, we have things that are still working. We have several orbiters that are still in action. Um, and I'm gonna talk primarily about these two, Spirit and Opportunity, two rovers. Here they are, much larger, five feet long, seven feet wide. They're wider than they are long because of the solar panels and about 400 pounds, where I don't know if I mentioned it, but Sojourner was only about 23 pounds. Here are some pictures. This is amazing, look at this. This is a dust devil on Mars. It only has less than 1% of our atmosphere, but there's still enough energy out there to generate a dust devil, meaning a tornado and kicking up some dust. Here are some frost patches. Um, Spirit took some of these pictures. They found some coatings on rocks that made them think that um, the surfaces were altered, and that happens on Earth by water acting on those rocks. So again, the thought is that's what happened on Mars. Another spirit photo, iron magnesium carbonates. On Earth, those things form when magma interacts with water. Now Mars has no magma right now and it has no water, but that tells us a little bit about the Martian past, that there were oceans in which magma intruded. At least that is one explanation for forming these rocks. This is something found by um, opportunity, meteorites on Mars. Because the atmosphere is so thin, more of them get through, a lot more friction on Earth. So we just found that one lying on the plains. This is a key. Right here, there's the sandstone. Sandstone on Earth forms from erosion and water deposition. And these little concretions of hematite, those tend to form in um, in an oxidizing environment, in an acidic environment on earth, in water, in brine, salt water. Now the Mars race continues. We're getting near the end because we're at 2018. We have a lot of things that are still working now. Curiosity Rover is still going. And I'm going to talk about that. Here is Sojourner. Here is Spirit and Opportunity. Here's curiosity about the weight of a small car, um, probably weighs more than a smart car. And it's about 10 feet long, even longer with the arm out as it's shown here. And here's a picture of curiosity, which is taken by its lander. And here's a nice graphic that I like. Um, here's where the rovers were all traveling all over the place. Curiosity is still alive, so we don't know how far it's going to go. Most of the others of these are no longer functioning. Um, including um, Opportunity, but Opportunity traveled over 28 miles. In other words, it ran, literally ran a marathon on the Martian surface. But the interesting thing is like most Americans don't know this, whose record for traveling on another planet did Opportunity beat? Right here, Lunokhod 2, Lunokhod 2, the Soviet rover from back in the 70s. That was the record. Now, here is a nice picture of where, where'd my cursor go? Where in Eagle Crater, where Curiosity landed, where Opportunity landed, it visited Endurance, went to Victoria, and then drove this huge way to the edge of Endeavor and wandered around here. And notice these cute planes. This one here, Lunacod Crater, which is when it passed Lunacod's record. And here is Marathon Valley, which is where it hit that 26 mile mark. So they're having fun up there. The purposes of the rovers, Sojourner was searching for current microbial life as we know it. There was none as far as we could tell. This is kind of a summary here. 
Spirit and opportunity, we're searching for signs of water, both ancient and modern. The answer is a lot of evidence for ancient lakes, riverbeds, chemistries, things like that. Also modern frost and thin coatings and permanent coatings at the poles. That's not from Spirit and Opportunity, but later missions will have more to say on that. Curiosity was looking to determine if Mars was ever capable of supporting life as we know it. The answer to that, capable of supporting life, I think the answer to that is yes. And what's coming next? There are three more, there are five more missions going to Mars on three different spacecraft. One from the United Arab Emirates, one from China, and one from NASA. And they are en route and they'll all be there within a year if nothing goes wrong. So to summarize, um, looks like I'm on time, 801, Jupiter and Saturn at sunset, Mars later, the Orionids after midnight, you'll see that on the homework assignment. As for Mars, it's visibly red, it varies in brightness, it's hard to observe with the telescope, you only have a, a window every two years and a really good window every 15 years. It changes from opposition to opposition in its surface markings causing, caused by dust. So that really makes it confusing when you're trying to map it. It was long assumed to have life. Space missions find a dry, red, dusty planet, overwhelming evidence for liquid water in the past. So many different things point to that. No current life as far as we know, but conditions were reasonable for life in the past. There are four rovers eventually made it to the surface, but right now we still have one lander, we still have one rover going, and we have half a dozen orbiting spacecraft, but they're all getting old. But fortunately, five new missions are on the way. So homework, you probably remember this. Watch Jupiter and Saturn slowly move close together. Check out the teapot, which would be easy to find. Find Altair and the Summer Triangle up here. And as a bonus, if you can, find Cygnus inside the triangle and Aquila the Eagle below. These are fairly bright constellations, maybe not as bright as the teapot in Sagittarius, but they're cool. Mars is visible later in the evening. It dominates after, let's say, about 10 or 11 at night when it gets high enough above the horizon to see. Enjoy this special time when Mars is brighter than Jupiter. You won't see that again for a very long time. Um, Venus outshines everything in the morning, as it always does. Don't miss the Orion meteor shower sometime within, sometime near October 22nd. It doesn't have to be that same day, but that's predicted to be the peak. Use these bright planets uh, to watch the moon move. In an hour, you can easily tell it moved. And as far as the equinox, notice right now how quickly the daylight is changing. That's a fun thing to look, especially if you can see the horizon and you can actually watch which tree the sun rises from. So we're at the end. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, we have a few. Excellent. So how were the Viking probes slowed down? Only by parachutes or what? Um, the Viking probes were slowed down, I believe, by parachutes, but they also had um, anything that comes into Mars at a speed that's going to get it there in a reasonable time is going to have a is going to need a heat shield and that heat shield is coming in on the bottom it looks a lot like the apollo craft coming down they'll have a heat shield and that heat shield is often jettisoned after the um uh after the chutes come out now some of the later landers had parachutes but what they also had once the parachutes caught in and slowed um the vehicle was they inflated a big bunch of gigantic um, inflatable balls, sort of like, um, if you will, uh, expanded styrofoam packing, kind of like packing peanuts when you mail something to somebody. And so they bounced along on the surface for quite some time, like a minute or more, until they came to a stop. And then all those um, big inflatable balls were deflated and the lander opened up. Yeah, they're like airbags designed to yes. absorb the impact. Yep, absolutely. All right, uh, here's a question. Is there water on Mars? They learned in fifth grade that there was. There is water on Mars, but it's not like on the Earth where we have oceans that are miles deep. You know, 
Um, Mars has a little bit of water in the atmosphere and it has water in the rocks. Um, where we see water on Mars is um, also at the, um, at the polar caps, which are permanent water deposits, although they're only you know, a few meters thick or so. I, I should, I gotta take that back. Can't say how exactly thick they are. Um, the big white spots that you see in a telescope or the tiny white spots that you see in a telescope at the poles um, during Martian winter for that pole um, are actually dry ice, they're carbon dioxide. The water part, the frozen water parts are significantly smaller, but they're there. So there is some water on Mars, but not like we have here. And I believe the, uh, the gravity of Mars is such that the water can actually escape from the pull, gravitational pull. Um, Mars's gravity is easily strong enough to hold water if there's nothing else going on. The oh, I'm thinking of, of magnetic, hydrogen, sorry. Yeah, the absence of magnetic field is uh, a bigger problem um, because it'll tend to, the uh, solar wind tends to rip off the atmosphere. Um, you can think of um, other planets that are significantly colder, but further out that have large atmospheres. And if you look at Venus, it's got a thicker atmosphere than Earth does. Well, that's not fair. Venus is bigger than Mars. But uh, looking at, um, let's say, some of the moons of Jupiter or of Saturn, again, it's, you, can, you can never compare things directly because they are much colder, but they're also significantly smaller than Mars, sometimes half the size. So they're big too, but they're half the size of Mars, and they have water and some form of an atmosphere. Right, and just sorry for the misinformation. It's it was hydrogen <laughs> that I was thinking. Oh, about. you're thinking of hydrogen. Oh, okay. I thought that was one of the questions you were reading. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, could there have been any other explanation for iron magnesium carbonates besides magma interaction with water? And if not, how did those oceans diminish over time? Was it caused by Mars's atmosphere or other things or both? If you need me to repeat that, let me know. Well, um, I wouldn't need to repeat because my answer is pretty easy. The first part is, I don't know. Um, normally carbonates, uh, carbonates are so, are relatively soluble and they are so easily formed. When you have um, carbon dioxide and water, you're gonna form carbonic acid whether you want to or not. And so any dissolved mineral will form carbonates. It is so easy to form carbonates that when you have other evidence for liquid water, you have to come up with the real reason why carbonates would not have formed that way. Um, but are there other ways to form carbonates? I wish I knew more about geology, but I don't. So I'm going to have to say no. And, and especially those little nodules, um, like the um, hematite. That act, well, that's a different thing. That's not carbonates. Um, so in terms of the atmosphere going away, uh, or certainly the water going away, um, as far as I'm aware, the water is believed to have gone, as um, Nick mentioned earlier, by evaporation, and it's simply evaporating off the planet. And a big driver for that is there is an atmosphere. If there's liquid water, there's some water vapor, some moisture in the atmosphere above it. But without a magnetic field, that gets ionized and ripped away very easily. The sun's magnetic field is pretty strong here. It's much weaker further out than some of the other planets. All right, uh, next question is, uh, on Earth, oxygen became prevalent due to stromolites and formed extensive deposits of iron oxide. Oh, that's not a question. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, so, and for those who don't know, the uh, I think you mean stromatolites, and that is a, essentially what amounts to a colony of bacteria where they're just kind of growing in one spot. And uh, they have um, a symbiotic relationship with, uh, they have the ability to absorb light and generate oxygen. So they're ancient plants. I'm calling them bacteria, that's not quite right. They're kind of like green algae slime. And they are growing in a colony. And so we have fossilized stromatolites from eons ago What's cool is that uh, in some parts, I mentioned Australia by Ayers Rock, it's interesting how this all comes together, but 
and some of the beaches of Australia, you actually have stromatolites growing today. Uh, but the key is, yes, yeah, so what they're doing and what green plants in general are doing is they are absorbing carbon dioxide and spitting out oxygen as a waste product. And you might say that uh, it would be very challenging for animal life to have come onto this earth without the oxygen that was created by stromatolites and other ancient green plants, green organisms of some sort. And that's an important point to realize because oxygen is highly reactive. Um, it oxidizes things. That's where we get the word from. It chews things up. It eats up metals. It rusts things. It reacts with stuff. And you don't normally have a lot of oxygen in a planet's atmosphere that has any other element. If there's carbon around, it will make carbon dioxide. If there's hydrogen around, it will make hydrogen oxide, which is water. Um, so the presence of oxygen usually means, well, I shouldn't say that. The presence of oxygen in Earth's case meant that it is being generated. If you just leave it alone, it would eventually chew everything up and the oxygen would be depleted. Uh, I guess following up on that by the same person, they said perhaps the oxygen in Mars stemmed from life and the iron oxide is evidence of it. Um, could be. But uh, you don't, for all the, um, all the, for the water on Mars and for the um, carbon dioxide on Mars, you don't necessarily have to have oxygen on a planet to form those. You could have had, you could have had water to start with. You're going to, I mean, oxygen is made, the element oxygen is made, we believe, um, in supernovas. It's made as in stellar interiors and then, then is spewed out. The reason we have oxygen and carbon in such abundance is because they are easy to make. They are a common process in stellar fusion. Um, so there's a lot of carbon and oxygen lying around. And all of the um, iron ox, all of the oxides, all of the silicates, all of the carbonates that we have here on Earth and anywhere else, obviously they all need oxygen. That's part of their chemical formula. Um, we have oxygen still today because um, because of life. If not for plant life, our oxygen would have been, whatever oxygen we might have had would long ago have been chewed up. All right, uh, we have four more questions currently. Okay. Um, when do you think that manned missions to Mars will happen? Wow. That is such an obvious question that you'd think, if I'm going to give a talk on Mars, I would have tried to look that up. Um, let's, let's put it this way. Let's, give, let's throw some numbers out. Uh, we went to the moon in the 1970s. We demonstrated our ability to do that. And then we just stopped. And people just asked, why are we going there? You might ask the same question about Mars. Um, that's a sort of a philosophical debate as to what we're going to, what we, if we send people to Mars, what we will learn is how to send people to Mars. If we want to do science, we're going to send robotic probes. I'm not a fan of robots, but that's the cost effective way to do it. Um, we are talking about using private companies like uh, SpaceX or, um, uh, potentially um, so some one of NASA's rockets uh, to get back to the moon in 2024, four years from now, to a place you've already been to. The moon is a quarter of a million miles away. Mars, at best, is 35 million miles away, well over 100 times further than the moon. Um, Getting to people seem to think that getting to Mars is going to be fairly easy. Getting to Mars is not going to be easy. We can anything. I be, I believe that people can do anything they set their mind to and they set their pocketbook to. But getting to Mars is not going to be cheap. It's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be soon. 
if we choose to go to Mars, we could certainly get there by my lifetime, by the end of my lifetime, assuming I live a normal lifetime. Um, beyond that, I don't know. And if you, there are plans in place for thinking about going to Mars. I know those plans are in place. People are talking about them, but I'm not up on that simply because my first question is, why would we want to do that? If we had all the money in the world, I would be in favor of it. But when there are so many other scientific missions that could be funded, and frankly, when there are so many people in the world who don't have enough to eat, um, I wonder what we should do with the money. Um, but I hope that it becomes easy to do, that we can go to Mars someday, and that maybe our grandchildren will be able to go there as tourists. That would be really cool. And you also have to consider, it's not just a matter of getting to Mars, it's getting back as well. <laughs> yes. And once you spend uh, half a year to get there, you better not spend three days and come back. So you're, you have to talk about a way in terms of how you can survive in space. And remember, the astronauts that went to the moon never did that. They brought everything they needed with them, and they took everything, and they brought it all back. Um, for a year long round trip to Mars, that's not an option. So all kinds of different technology needs to be developed and understood. Understood well, because somebody is going to be depending on that technology for a year for that person's life. So it's, a, it's anything is doable, but it's not just like going to the moon, but a little further. It's a whole nother ball game. So three questions remaining. Why was Mars able to sustain lakes and rivers ages ago, but cannot now? Isn't it too cold and wasn't it always? Well, since uh, most planets started out fairly hot during the collision period um, and during the formation period, it's probably colder now than it once was. But again, the understanding is that it was formed with water or perhaps received water from comet bombardment. Um, that was one of the theories for Earth to receive some of it, at least some of its water um, through comets from the um, Kuiper belt, from the Earth cloud. Um, so it's easy to understand how Mars got water. The issue is how is it ripped away? How is it removed? And again, um, my best understanding of that is because of the when Mars was young and warm, it would have had a molten core and would have presumably had a magnetic field, which could have protected it. Um, boy, had I known there were going to be this many um, comments on the presence of water come and gone, I should have prepared some slides on this. Slides for next time. Um, but again, my understanding is that these things are easily lost when you're this close to the sun and you don't have a magnetic field. And you're small. You know, gravity is one-tenth that of Earth. Well, we have another question related to water. <laughs> uh -huh. Why do we use our own understanding of what we believe we need to determine if life ever existed on Mars as water and air uh, that we use as a standard of life? Yeah, that's a good question because you always have to worry that, okay, I know how this can work in this way. And then you assume that everything else in the universe has to work in the same way. Um, and that seems very parochial and seems very short sighted um, at first. But when you start, I don't want to, I could, this could be a one hour talk right here. But I'll try to confine my response to a minute or so. Um, if you're going to form life, you have to form it from the chemical elements. That's all you've got. And what kind of chemical elements can you have? Um, carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and you know, hydrogen is leftover unreacted fuel in stars. Carbon, hydrogen, um, nitrogen are very common. Uh, so it would be very reasonable that you would form life that's carbon-based. Oxygen-oxygen bonds are weak. Carbon-oxygen bonds are strong. Carbon-carbon bonds are strong. Carbon-hydrogen bonds are strong. Carbon gives you a scaffold 
on which you can make strong bonds to make long molecules that can do complicated things like proteins, but yet have reactive sites where they can actually do something like proteins um, once they're made. So it has a real good balance of reactivity and stability. Um, you look down in the periodic table at other elements like silicon that have some similar properties, and that's true, but bottom line is you don't make as much silicon in stars as you make carbon. And also the silicon-silicon bonds are so much weaker. Um, there's so many things that make it hard to get away from carbon. Now, carbon-based life might be very difficult in a very cold temperature simply because carbon isn't reactive enough. And then maybe those weak silicon phosphorus bonds, for example, relatively weak, can start coming into play. And maybe you could have life based on that. But whatever you make life of, you've got to have a lot of it. And uh, maybe that's one reason why we are looking for, for this type of life. And also, you want to have a solvent that dissolves a lot of things that's liquid at a reasonable temperature. Nitrogen is liquid. Um, you've, you've heard of liquid nitrogen or liquid methane but um, on some of the other planets, moons. But uh, nitrogen and methane are liquid at such cold temperatures. It's hard to imagine anything happening at those temperatures. And they're so nonpolar, they don't dissolve anything. There's no way to get minerals into those systems. Need something polar like water or ammonia is another decent example, or even methanol, which is found um, extraterrestrially. Uh, but again, all of those things tend to point you towards carbon, oxygen, nitrogen forms of life. Could there be other forms of life? Sure. But since I wasn't responsible for putting the life there in the first place, I'll leave it to the one responsible to decide how he wishes life to occur elsewhere. All so right. I think we still have one more, right? Yep. Yeah, we're down to our last question. Is there evidence of ice under the frozen poles of, on Mars? And I believe they're referring to ice water. Um, there, yes, there is. Um, I, w I don't even know if I want to say there is evidence. Um, it is pretty much beyond doubt that there is water ice at the poles. It is perennially cold there, 100 degrees below zero, um, more or less. And uh, there is water there. But it's, but it's ice, just so we're, we're, we're clear. Yeah, it's water ice. Well, that was the last question. All right. So I'll wait a moment or two if anyone was just listening to the conversation and wants to type something in. Because uh, it's, you know, 820 and I'm not going anywhere. And uh, whether we get another question or not, I will certainly want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I really appreciate um, people tuning in. I'm tuning in, good grief. Um, Nick, what's a good word for Zooming in? <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Uh, okay. Just well, joining our Zoom. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, any further questions come in? Uh, nope. All right, well then this is uh, um, Edmund Stark and Nick Kenton at, signing off from MSU St. Andrews STEM Center. Thank you very much.